The Chimpanzees I Love Meet the author. Jane Goodall is an amazing person. When she was a girl, Jane dreamed of going to Africa to study wild animals. As an adult, she ran a 55-year study of chimpanzee society. She is the world's leading expert on chimps. Through her study, Jane showed for the first time that chimps have emotions. Also for the first time, she observed chimps using tools. Jane is a strong supporter of wildlife preservation. Meeting the Chimpanzees Chimpanzees are more like humans than any other creature living today. When I began to study them in 1960, almost nothing was known about their behavior in the wild. In the early 1920s, a scientist named Henry W. Nissen had tried to study them in West Africa, but he had learned very little. And so it was exciting when I first arrived in my study area, now the Gombe National Park in Tanzania. Ever since I was 10 years old and had fallen in love with the Tarzan stories, I had dreamed of living with animals in Africa and writing books about them. And finally, when I was 26 years old, I was able to fulfill that dream. It all began when I was a small child, loving animals of all kinds. Luckily, I had a wonderful mother who encouraged my interest. When I hid in a hen house for four hours to find out where an egg came out, none of the family knew where I was. They searched and searched and finally called the police. Just as dusk was falling, my mother saw an excited four-year-old child rushing the house, all covered in straw. Instead of scolding me, she sat down to hear the marvelous story of how a hen lays an egg. She helped me find books about animals, and when I began talking about going to Africa when I grew up, she was the only person who did not laugh at me. Instead, she told me that if I worked hard, took advantage of opportunities, and never gave up, I would find a way. And of course, I did. As you read this book, you will see that chimpanzees are like us in many ways, and this makes them particularly fascinating to study. Like us, each chimp has his or her own unique personality. Chimpanzees look different from one another, too. Their brains, their blood, their DNA, the way their bodies are put together, it's all so human-like. It helps us to understand that we, like chimpanzees, are part of the great animal kingdom. Learning about chimpanzees helps us to understand ourselves better, too. I was 22 years old and working in a documentary film studio in London when I received a letter from an old school friend inviting me to Kenya for a holiday. This was the opportunity I had been waiting for. I saved up enough money, working as a waitress, for a round-trip boat fare and set off. After I had been in Africa a number of months, I arranged a meeting with Dr. Louis Leakey, the famous paleontologist. Because I had learned so much about animals and Africa, even though I had never been to college, he was impressed not only by my enthusiasm, but by my knowledge. He let me be part of a small group that went on a dig for three months each summer to look for the fossilized remains of our earliest ancestors. It was in a wild place named Olduvai Gorge, far from civilization and he watched to see how I got on in the African bush. I passed his test, 
and he offered me the opportunity to go and try to learn about chimpanzees in the wild. It took Lewis a year to find funds for me to start. I had no training, I had no degree, and I was a female. Women didn't do that kind of thing in those days. But eventually, he managed to get money for a six-month trial. The British authorities refused to allow a young woman into the bush on her own, but they reluctantly agreed to the expedition, provided I took a companion. And it was my amazing mother who volunteered to come for the first four months. After that, I was allowed to stay on without her. From the moment I set foot on the eastern shores of Lake Tanganyika at Gombe, I felt at home. But I soon found that there was one major problem. The chimpanzees were afraid of me. Even when I was on the other side of a narrow valley, they took one look and vanished. Sometimes I despaired. I was afraid that the six months would come to an end before I had discovered anything of importance. But I found a wonderful vantage point, a rocky outcrop that I called the peak. Every day I climbed up before dawn. I always wore the same colored clothes and looked at the chimpanzees from afar through my binoculars in order not to startle them. From the peak, I began to learn more and more about chimpanzees and their way of life. Everything that I saw, I jotted into a little field notebook, which I wrote out in a journal every evening. In 1962, I was joined by Dutch photographer and filmmaker Hugo van Lawick. And as the work increased, we employed more people to help. That meant that observations could continue even when I had to go to Cambridge University to work for my Ph.D. degree. Today, most of the daily records, on baboons as well as chimpanzees, are taken by a team of Tanzanian field staff from the small villages that surround the national park. They follow a different chimpanzee each day and record his or her behavior. Gradually, we have built up a collection of unique life histories and family histories. There are two co-directors of the research, one Tanzanian and one British. And at any one time, there are three or four graduate students studying different aspects of behavior. We expect that the research at Gombe will continue indefinitely into the future. We are still learning new things. As I write this, Flo's daughter Fifi, who was a little infant when I began the study, is about 40 years old and has just had her eighth infant. She could easily live another 10 to 15 years. Being accepted. I shall never forget the excitement and wonder of my first months at Gombe. The forests are home to all sorts of animals, and gradually I got to know them. I met many troops of monkeys, baboons, and red colobus, vervet, red tail, and blue monkeys. Sometimes I startled a bushbuck with its chestnut coat or a bustling reddish-colored bush pig. There were a couple of small herds of forest buffalo. I tried to avoid them after being charged and chased up a tree by two bulls. I learned to identify countless fascinating birds, ranging from the tiny sunbirds to the huge and secretive Varro eagle owl. Some have brilliant colors. Many have beautiful songs. There were two or three crocodiles in the lake, 
and monitor lizards, chameleons, and geckos. I saw all kinds of frogs and toads, and so many snakes, some poisonous, including the deadly green and black mambas and the feared storms water cobras, which kill quite a few fishermen when they get caught in their nets. Sometimes I met a huge python, and of course, there were all the thousands of species of insects, including fantastic butterflies and moths, as well as the less pleasing tsetse flies and malaria-carrying mosquitoes. As I became more and more familiar with my beautiful new world, I also learned more and more about the chimps. I observed how they wandered about in small, always changing groups, calling back and forth across the valleys. Sometimes I saw two groups join and feed together in a tree. I watched as they charged about in excitement sometimes hitting one another, sometimes embracing. I watched them make sleeping beds or nests up in the trees in the evening by bending branches over a firm foundation, then bending the ends back over again. I climbed into some of these nests and found that they were strong and comfortable. The chimps mostly traveled from place to place on the ground. Like the other great apes, chimpanzees are knuckle walkers, which means that although they walk on the soles of their feet like we do, they also walk on the backs of the middle joints of their fingers. Sometimes I saw a chimp walking upright for a short distance when he or she wanted to look over tall grass, when carrying fruits in both hands, or when it was raining. It seems that chimps don't like putting their hands on the ground when it is cold and wet. After an outbreak of polio, two males, each of whom had lost the use of one arm, learned to walk long distances completely upright to keep their limp hands from trailing on the ground. Chimps spend a lot of time feeding and resting in the trees. Their feet are more like human hands to look at, with the big toe acting like a thumb. This makes it easy for them to hold on to branches when climbing. Like the other apes, chimps can swing hand over hand. This is known as brachiating from branch to branch. We can swing too because our shoulder joints are made the same way. But our fingers are not long or strong enough for us to do it for long distances. I began to learn about the chimps' diet. I saw them eating fruits of many kinds, and leaves, flowers, seeds, nuts, buds, pith, and stems. After watching them feed, I collected specimens of the tree or plant, which my mother put in plant presses to dry so that they could be identified later. Exciting Discoveries One day, in October 1960, I saw something really amazing. It was just after the rainy season had begun. I was walking through tall, wet grass when I saw a dark shape hunched over the golden red earth of a termite mound. Carefully, I moved closer and peered through the undergrowth. It was a male chimpanzee, and he was using a grass stem as a tool. He pushed the stem carefully into one of the passages leading into the nest 
and waited a moment. Then he withdrew it and picked off the insects with his lips and crunched them up. Sometimes he picked a leafy stem and stripped off the leaves so that it would fit into the narrow opening. He was not only using grass stems as tools, he was actually making tools. This was a really exciting observation, for up until then, it had been thought that only human beings could use and make tools. Another important day, at about the same time, was when I saw chimpanzees eating meat. A male, a female, and a young chimpanzee were making a meal of a baby bush pig carcass. A few months later, I saw chimpanzees actually hunting. Their prey was a young red colobus monkey, separated from its troop. The chimpanzees showed real cooperation as they surrounded the monkey while one of them raced up the tree to make the kill. Then they all shared the meat. Before these observations, it was thought that chimpanzees were vegetarian. When the National Geographic Society heard about termite fishing and about hunting and meat eating, they agreed to give me a grant so that I could carry on with the research. By this time, I had learned to recognize some of the chimpanzees, and then I gave them names. It was not thought scientific at that time to give names to research subjects. I should have referred to them by numbers, but I had always named my animal friends, and I saw no reason to treat the chimpanzees differently. Today, most field biologists name the animals they study. The first chimpanzee who learned to trust me was one I named David Greybeard. He came to my camp for the ripe red fruit of an oil nut palm and found, and took, some bananas. I began to leave bananas out for him, and gradually other chimpanzees followed him to this new food source. Goliath and William, and then old Flo and her family, and many others. After about a year, I was able to get quite close to many of the chimps when I came upon them in the forest. And once I knew them apart, I started to understand their complex society. The Chimpanzee Community The community that I gradually got to know at Gombe was made up, at that time, of more than 50 individuals. There were about 14 adult males, slightly more adult females, and a collection of adolescents, juveniles, and infants. We now know that in some areas, communities may be as large as 80 individuals. Within a community, all the individuals know one another, but there are some who do their best to avoid each other, some who meet only occasionally, and some who spend a lot of time together and are real friends. This is not at all like a troop of monkeys, for instance, where all the members stay together almost all the time for traveling and feeding and sleeping. A chimpanzee mother and her dependent children, up to the age of seven or eight years, are always together. Most days they meet up with other members of their community for a while, but they also spend time away from other chimpanzees, sleeping and traveling on their own. Sometimes many members of the community join one another in large excited gatherings, usually when an especially delicious food ripens in one part of their range. Within the community, the chimpanzees, for the most part, have relaxed and friendly relations. 
Male chimpanzees are very sociable and enjoy one another's company. Sometimes they travel around in all male groups. But every so often, a male leaves his companions and travels on his own, or with a female, or a group of females and young. It was not until I had been studying them long enough to realize who was related to whom that I really began to understand chimpanzees' social life. Very close relationships develop between mothers and their grown offspring and often between siblings. Brothers, in particular, sometimes become very close friends and allies as they grow up. They continue to spend some time with their mothers and families throughout their lives. The same is true for daughters, unless they decide to transfer into a neighboring community, in which case they will probably never see their families again. We still don't know why some females make this choice. In chimpanzee society, the various individuals are arranged in a dominance hierarchy, or pecking order. I found that Goliath, David Greybeard's friend, was the boss, or alpha. JB ranked number two. Then came Hugh and Hugo, and on down the ranks. I noticed that the adult males were able to dominate all females. The females seemed to have their own ranking order, though it was usually not very clear. Flo was obviously the highest ranked. Her friend, old Ollie, ranked lowest. Goliath was not the biggest of the males, nor was he the most aggressive. But he had a fearless nature, and he worked hard to stay on top. Male chimpanzees challenge each other by performing dramatic charging displays. They hurtle across the ground, stamping and slapping, swaying or dragging branches, picking up and hurling stones. Those with the most frequent or imaginative displays are likely to rise high in the dominance hierarchy. Goliath had a very fast and impressive charging display, but in 1964, he lost his position to Mike. At first, Mike was very low ranking, but he was determined to change that. When he was in camp, he learned to use empty four-gallon kerosene cans in his displays. Again and again, I watched him gather up two or even three cans and charge toward a group of chimps, hitting and kicking the cans ahead of him. Even Goliath rushed out of the way. And then, when Mike stopped, the others hurried to pay their respects to him. We never saw him actually fighting, but he took over the top position in just four months. Mike reigned for six years, by which time he looked old. He was probably about 45 years old, and he lost his position to the younger, heavier, and very aggressive Humphrey. Every male who has made it to the top has done so in a different way, and I have written their stories in some of my other books. After Humphrey came Fegan, then Goblin, Wilkie, Freud, and Frodo, who is Alpha now, February 2001. Chimpanzees within a community seldom fight really seriously. Most of their squabbles are settled by threatening postures and gestures. They wave their arms and swagger upright with bristling hair, giving loud barking calls. The lower-ranked individuals give way and fights are avoided. And often, after aggression, the victim approaches the aggressor and crouches submissively, 
making whimpering calls or screaming. Usually the victim is reassured with a gentle pat on the back or a kiss or embrace. In this way, peace is restored. When chimps do fight, it usually looks and sounds much worse than it is, as one or both scream loudly. Aggressors hit, stamp on, or drag their victims, but they rarely bite, and their fights seldom result in severe wounding. Females fight each other most often over food or to defend their young. Males fight much more often than females, and their fiercest fights are when they are competing for social dominance. We also see fighting between members of different communities. This aggression is the most severe and brutal of all. Adult males frequently patrol the boundaries of their territory. And if they encounter a stranger, a chimpanzee from another community, they may give chase. If the victim is caught, he or she is subjected to a terrible gang attack. Strangers, usually adult females, very often die of their wounds. Only adolescent females are not attacked. Instead, the patrolling males try to lead them back into the heart of their own community range. During one four-year period, we watched as the males of one community attacked the adult males and females of a smaller neighboring community one by one and left them to die of their wounds. It was a kind of war. It did not end until the smaller community was destroyed, all except the adolescent females. I was very sad and shocked when I found that the chimpanzees, just like us, have a dark side to their nature. We used to think that only humans engaged in war, but I found that chimpanzees sometimes show warlike behavior too. It was terrible to watch when a group of chimps brutally attacked an individual. You might wonder why we did not try to defend the victims. In fact, chimpanzees are so much stronger than us, and they become so violent when roused, that there was nothing we could do. We did try to help the wounded victims afterward. How Chimps Communicate Chimpanzees are like humans in so many ways, but obviously there are many differences too. Perhaps the most significant difference is that we, and only we, have developed a sophisticated spoken language. Only with a language of words can you discuss things, make plans for the distant future, teach about objects or events that are not present, and bounce ideas back and forth in a group. Chimps do communicate with sounds, of course. They have many calls, at least 34 we can identify, and they all mean different things. There are small, friendly grunts, angry barking sounds, the soft whimpers of distress, and there are frightened or angry screams, loud wailing alarm calls, a frightening sound in the forest, and the pant hoot that chimps use to communicate over distance. Each individual has his or her own distinct voice, so when you hear a pant hoot, you know who is calling. This is how scattered community members keep in contact. Chimpanzees also communicate with facial expressions, gestures, and body postures, just as we do. A low-ranking individual may greet a superior male with soft grunts and by crouching in front of him, sometimes holding out a hand. An upright swagger with hair bristling is a threat. 
touching is very important. Frightened chimps reach out to touch or hug each other. Friendly individuals may kiss or embrace or hold hands. A pouting face means distress. A huge grin with teeth showing means fear. They smile and laugh with their lower teeth showing. Chimpanzees may spend more than an hour grooming each other, moving their fingers gently through each other's hair, cleaning the skin. This is very soothing and is an important part of friendly behavior. Mothers calm their infants with grooming and spend hours grooming with grown-up offspring. Grooming is especially important between adult males as they need to help one another to protect their joint territory. I shall never forget the day when David Greybeard allowed me to groom him. An adult male chimpanzee living in the wild trusted me so much that he let me groom him. I decided later it was a mistake. It is not good to make direct contact with the chimpanzees for many reasons. We want to observe their natural behavior and not interfere. If they get too familiar, they can be dangerous, as chimps are so much stronger than humans. They might catch an infectious disease from us, or we from them. But some of those early interactions were so special. It was a wonderful reward for hours of patience and determination. Scientists used to think that only humans have emotions, such as happiness and sadness, anger, fear, and despair. Now many researchers are studying animal emotions. As with humans, often you can tell a lot about the mood of a chimpanzee by watching the expression on his or her face. I had one wonderful communication with David Greybeard as I followed him in the forest. When he sat close to a little stream, I sat nearby. I saw a ripe red fruit of an oil nut palm lying on the ground. Chimps love these fruits. I held it out to him on my palm. He turned his head away. I held it closer. He looked into my eyes, took the nut, dropped it, then very gently held my hand. It is the way chimpanzees reassure one another. He didn't want the nut, but he knew I meant well. It was a communication between human and chimpanzee that could be understood without words. It was a moment I shall remember all my life. I can still close my eyes and feel the soft, warm skin of his fingers pressing mine. Mother and Babies I have learned so much about the importance of family life from Fifi and her old mother, Flo. Their family is known as the F family, since all its members have names beginning with F. I first knew Fifi when she was a little infant in 1961. Ten years later, Fifi gave birth for the first time. She made a big night nest and settled down. In the morning, little Freud, as we called the baby, was in the nest with her. In the wild, most females know how to care for their babies because they have watched other mothers and, unless they were the last born in a family, have been able to play with, groom, and carry their younger brothers and sisters. That was certainly true for Fifi. Flo had been a wonderful mother, attentive, protective, affectionate, and playful. 
She also supported Fifi when she and her brothers got into trouble with other chimps. Fifi had learned much about maternal behavior from watching Flo with her young brother, Little Flint, in 1964. She had been absolutely fascinated by the infant and spent hours sitting close to Flo, wanting to groom or play with him. When Flint was five months old, Flo sometimes let her carry him when the family traveled. Fifi's own infant, Freud, was born in 1971. Fifi was an excellent mother from the start. When Freud nuzzled her breast, searching for the nipple and making tiny hoo-hoo sounds, she helped him so that he could suckle. She always cradled him with one hand as she traveled until he was strong enough to cling on by himself. Other mothers are less concerned mothers, like Passion and Patty. Passion was rather harsh and cold in her treatment of her infants, though she got better with each successive birth. Patty simply had no idea how to care for her firstborn, who died as a result. She was not much better with her second, but he survived in spite of his mother's lack of skill. By the time she gave birth for the fifth time, Patty was a very good mother. I loved watching Fifi and Freud. She cared for him so well. For five years, Freud suckled and shared his mother's nest at night. At first, he always clung to her belly when she traveled. But at five months, he began to ride more and more often on her back. He took his first tottering steps and climbed his first branches at the same time, always under the watchful eye of his mother. Fifi, like her mother Flo, was sociable and spent a lot of time with other members of the community. Once he had learned to walk and climb, Freud had a lot of opportunities to play with others, including adult males. He learned a lot during play about the characters of other infants and also about the characters of their mothers. If he upset a child with a high-ranking mother, he would be quickly scolded. And then Fifi would get involved, hurrying over to defend Freud. Freud also learned a lot when he was amusing himself, leaping about in the branches or playing with various objects, as a human child plays with toys. He learned from experience. He learned what was frightening and how to behave in all sorts of different situations. When Freud made a mistake, he was sometimes punished. If, for example, he went too close to a male who was in a bad mood, he sometimes got threatened, even hit. And he learned, too, by watching and then imitating what others did, especially his mother, Fifi. He ate what she ate in the same way. He practiced using grass tools when she was fishing for termites sticks when she was catching ants, leaves when she was drinking from a rain-filled hollow in a tree, and so on. Freud, like all infants, was very upset when Fifi began to wean him, when she would not let him suckle or ride on her back. He would rush off screaming and hitting the ground. Then Fifi followed and held him tight. You can't have milk or ride on my back anymore, she seemed to be telling him, but I love you just as much. By the time Freud was five years old and had accepted the new rules, his little brother was born. Freud, like almost all older brothers and sisters, was fascinated by the new baby, Frodo. As soon as Fifi allowed it, 
Freud began to play with, groom, and carry Frodo. Because Freud stayed with Fifi even after weaning, he was a wonderful playmate for the new infant and a role model too. Frodo watched everything his big brother did and often tried to do the same. Because of this, he did a lot of things at a younger age than Freud had. It was fascinating to see how the members of this family helped one another. Fifi, like many other individuals, became higher ranking as she got older. And so when Freud began to challenge the females of his community, he got the better of all those who ranked lower than Fifi because she always rushed to help him. And then as he grew older, he in turn helped Fifi until she became the top ranking female. He and Fifi both helped Frodo in his battles. And as more offspring were born, they all helped one another. The youngest family members had even more older siblings, brothers and sisters to help them. When Freud was 10 years old, he began to challenge the adult males. Gradually, he worked his way up to the top position by the time he was 22. He ruled the community for four years. Then, when Freud was very sick during an epidemic of a horrible skin disease, his top position was seized by his younger brother, Frodo. Fifi was also very sick, losing all her hair. And her seventh infant, Fred, was so sick that he died. Two Special Stories Throughout the 40 years of the study at Gombe, we have known some wonderful chimpanzee characters, a few of whom I have described in this book. And we have observed some amazing and often rather sad events. When Flo died, she must have been over 50 years old. She was shrunken, her hair sparse, her teeth worn to the gums. She avoided big groups and traveled mostly on her own, accompanied only by eight-year-old Flint. He was with his mother when she died, and although he was easily old enough to fend for himself, it seemed as though he couldn't cope with life without her. He became more and more depressed. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to interact with other chimps. In this state, he fell sick and died six weeks after losing Flo. I think he died of grief. And then there is my very favorite story. When Miff died, she left a sole surviving child, three and a quarter year old Mel. Infant chips depend on milk for at least three years. And Mel was not only very young, but sickly too. We were sure he would die. To our amazement, a 12-year-old male adolescent, Spindle, adopted him. He waited for Mel in travel and let the infant ride on his back and sleep with him at night. He shared his food when Mel begged, and he even rushed to move Mel to safety if the infant got too close to big males about to start their wild charging displays. This is something a mother does until her child is old enough to get out of the way itself. It is important because during their charging displays, the big males sometimes pick up and throw or drag infants who are in their way. They don't seem to notice them. This was particularly brave of Spindle because he was at that age when adolescent males have to be more and more cautious of the big males who see them as potential rivals.
Usually, they keep well out of the way when their heroes are socially excited. Spindle actually got hit on several occasions when he rescued Mel, but he always did it. Spindle saved Mel's life. It is interesting to know that Spindle lost his mother, the ancient Sprout, during the epidemic that killed Mel's mother. At 12 years old, a chimp doesn't need his mother to survive. But if he gets beaten up, or gets hurt or scared in any way, he will go and spend time with his mother, if she is alive. Perhaps the death of Sprout left a space in Spindle's heart. Perhaps his close contact with small Mel, who depended on him so much, helped to fill that space. I don't suppose we shall ever know. Facts and Resources Chimpanzee Classification The chimpanzee, whose scientific name is Pantroglodites, is a primate. The primate family includes galegos, or bush babies, lemurs, marmosets, monkeys, apes, and humans. Apes are human-like creatures with no tails. There are the so-called lesser apes, the gibbons and siamangs, and the great apes, orangutans in Asia, chimpanzees, bonobos, formerly called pygmy chimpanzees, and gorillas in Africa. Humans are another kind of great ape. Today, monkeys are smaller than apes, but there were huge monkeys and lemurs in prehistoric times. Scientists believe that primates are descended from small, insect-eating mammals that lived about 65 million years ago. Gradually, some of them grew larger, and they became more intelligent. Apes and humans descended from a common ancestor sometime within the last 15 to 20 million years. Chimpanzees are more like us than any other creature alive today. The structure of their DNA differs from ours by only just over 1%. Humans can receive blood transfusions from chimpanzee donors, and chimpanzees can catch or be given all our infectious diseases, which is why some scientists use them in medical research. In fact, biologically, chimpanzees are more closely related to humans than they are to gorillas. Discuss. Choose one section of the text. Identify the main idea and key details, and write a summary of the section.